Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to Sunday Seconds with the Duke on the MHM Podcast Network. Our monthly white hat reviews of films dedicated to the stuff men are made of. John Wayne. I'm Chris. I'm Lori. And I'm Frostbitten Patrick. He is cold as ice. In this episode, we are reviewing 1953's Chili 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 movie, Island in the Sky, which is based on a true story about a flight on February 3rd, 1943, where a plane goes down and men are stranded. This film was directed by William A. Wellman, the William A. Wellman, and stars John Wayne, Lloyd Nolan, Andy Devine, and Walter Abel, and actually a, a pretty large cast of people from the 50s. Uh, but before we begin, who has the typo-ridden summary? That would be me. Both paragraphs of it. Based on a chapter in the 1944 novel, Fate is the Hunter, written by Ernest K. Gann, Island in the Sky follows the story of a pilot and a crew of a World War II-era Douglas C-47 Skytrain. The pilot, Dooley, played by John Wayne, is a former airline pilot who is pressed into service during the war to fly war supplies across the northern route to England. During a return run, Dooley and his crew encounter formidable weather conditions that begin to ice their plane over. Dooley is forced to land the plane in the uncharted wildlands near the Quebec-Labrador border due to low visibility and icy conditions. However, they are unsure where they la- However, they are unsure where they have landed specifically and cannot radio their specific location to would-be rescuers. To make matters even worse, the Arctic, the Arctic conditions that they find themselves in, as well as their lack of food, make the crew's chances of survival on land almost, ba- almost as bad as their chances in the sky. Dooley's men encounter extreme winter cold with temperatures plummeting to negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit with visibility a mere few feet. Dooley's co-pilot, Lovett, dies during a storm after he gets trapped in a whiteout and is unable to find his way back to shelter. Things begin to look grim for Dooley and his crew. However, Dooley's pilot friends will not rest while a fellow airman's life is in danger. The ragtag group of pilots begins a methodical search of the snow-covered mountains, desperately listening for the ever-fading radio signal from Dooley's radio. They look for Dooley's plane and smoke from the crew, but despite flying near Dooley's crew a couple of times, they just don't see the small plane on the frozen lake. Ultimately, the rescue teams make one last attempt to find the nearly frozen airmen and fortunately come across them in the nick of time. The rescue planes drop supplies and messages for Dooley and his men, Dooley and the crew will soon be saved by rescue planes as they escape from their island in the sky. Um, Island in the Sky was released on September 3rd, 1953 and made $2.75 million. I couldn't find a budget for this one, but I can't imagine it was too much. It's about uh, $900,000 is what the budget was. Is that what you saw? Okay. Rotten Tomatoes didn't even have critics review this one. Or rate this one. But the audience gives it a 61. And I didn't find any awards or anything. It, it, this was a pretty... I think it's well regarded as... Um, for the, the genre. But uh, of kind of like this authentic war uh, rescue. Search and rescue type film. But other than that, it doesn't really have a whole lot of notoriety past that, I don't think. No, I mean, it gets it gets confused with... The other John Wayne uh, plane landing in the middle of nowhere film, The High and the Mighty, which came out. I can't remember if it's the year before or the year after, but it comes out around the same time as this film. And For some I reason, I want to say 1954. It. Does that sound about right? It, it could be. I, I, to be honest with you, I, off the top of my head, I know they were, they were they released like back-to-back years, but I just don't remember which one came first. Had you seen this one before? I might. <laughs> oh. I, 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 to be honest with you, I literally confuse it with the oh, High and okay. the Mighty. I, I, I know I've, I, I know I've seen them. I, I think I've seen them both, but I can't remember which one. I, if I haven't seen one, it blurs the 
it's so they're so similar that it, it's hard for me to mm-hmm. think of that that I had I, oh this is brand new I've never seen this one. Does he play the same kind of character in the High and the Mighty? Uh, he does play the pilot, yes. So, and I believe a plane does does go down in kind of snow covered area, and that's there's a lot of similarities between them. And so it's 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 and it was also I think directed by Wellman as well. So, I mean, it is it is a very very it's a genre that at least in the fifties became a little popular there for a little while, and and they just you know popped out one after another. That's like me getting the two movies based upon the Leopold and Loeb case confused. <laughs> I get it. It's easy to do when they're similar like that and you haven't seen them in a long time. Well, well, yeah, but when you have the same director and the same actor, that's something completely distinctly different. <laughs> it's that, hey, maybe you're just doing the same film. And that this is what the, t- the type of film Wellman liked to do. Um, you know, he, he was an ex-pilot himself, so he had a certain fondness for for airplanes um his work nickname was wild bill which is pretty similar to Lori's world war one uh nickname of wild Lori. <laughs> um but the william weldman he's the guy who who earned the very first academy award for best picture on the very first academy award ceremony in back in 1927 uh it was the silent film wings uh, Lori, have you seen that one i know i you- have it's a great movie the uh, battle scene, the in the air, are amazing. I agree with Laurie that the, some of the the uh, aerial footage is is pretty impressive considering the era that it was made in. Uh, you know, it, obviously, Wellman had a passion for films involving airplanes. Uh, he really liked planes, didn't like women, and that's kind of what that was his bread and butter. And he stuck to it until he died. <laughs> Now, now, Laurie, this wasn't a traditional John Wayne role. Um, he wasn't quite as macho in this one. What did you think uh, of his character in this film? Because it was definitely different from the, the past roles we've seen him in thus far. This was a totally different John Wayne than I've ever seen, than any role I've ever seen him in. And I think that if I had been introduced to him in this role, I would have been a fan of his. I really liked his character and and the way he played, the way he portrayed the character in this film. Well, aren't you a fan of him now? Um, I'm get yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate him. I never, I never had any appreciation for him. But you know, when you when you're first, and I don't even remember what the first film I ever saw. I don't think I'd ever even watched a whole film, but I just saw him kind of swagger and. And in any film I saw him and he had that same voice. It just seemed to me like he was just the same character in every film. But you, too, are proving that assumption incorrect by in- introducing me to these films. Well, I mean, this well, is a good one for you, though, because I think he was a, a very everyman sort of character that uh, it didn't really stand out. He's just doing what he had to do to to get everybody safe. And I think he had a little bit of doubt of his own abilities at times. So I think he was a very human character in this. He was very humble. And that was something I'm not used to seeing and very um, vulnerable. And it was, it was a really neat character and, and he did a great job with the acting. It wasn't overplayed. And um, I don't, I don't think it was an easy role to play. You know, it's funny because you know I read that in the research about how he plays a. It was a very distinctly different character, but I don't really think it's that far removed from a traditional John Wayne film. Not trying to reinforce the stereotype that we've just convinced you does didn't exist, but <laughs> is that he still? It, they say is he's not. It, he did not display any kind of the machismo that he he did in other ro- roles or what he's often criticized for doing. But I mean, he's still like an airplane pilot, you know, living on the edge, flying these dangerous runs over the Arctic, you know, uh, it, it just, and he holds his crew together and even threatens to shoot them if they try to, to make it out on their own. I mean, there, there's, I don't see that this role that differently. I mean, it's a little bit more vulnerable due to the kind of that, the um, overdub of his thoughts, what he, what he's thinking, 
which you just don't get in other films. But the outward portrayal of the character, I, I still think to all the other characters, I think is very much in line with most John Wayne films or but John Wayne characters. Like. He didn't have that swagger and that, and I think it was probably the, the situation that he was in. He didn't have that confidence that he normally brings to the screen. And it was, um, I found it, um, I, I liked it. I found it delightful. I mean, the if the John Wayne from like the Searchers or Stagecoach, he would have been able to grind that coffee grinder the whole time until the planes could hear him. He would have just sat there because he had the inner strength to. But this one, you know, he he was human. He had flaws. He he got tired. He they had to rest, and he recognized that you know that they have their own limits. And I I think that's kind of what you don't see in a whole lot of other John Wayne films. And I, I still think it, it's still there. It's just, it's, it's tempered. And as far as the swagger, it was cold. I mean, he's wearing <laughs> all those puffy clothes. Well, it is hard, hard to, to swagger when you're chilly. They didn't yeah, always look a... cold. In some scenes, I, I noticed that. That there were, like, when they were in the plane and they were sticking their head out, you couldn't see their breath. But in other scenes, you could see their breath. You know, I, I just, yeah. I, I didn't think that was well played all the time. <laughs> I think when you could see their breath that they were actually smoking cigarettes, Lori. Well, don't ruin the illusion, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the other character that I kind of want to talk about is Andy Devine's Willie Moon, because out of all the other characters in this film, he kind of stuck out to me. Um, he, you know, he plays comedic cowboys quite a bit, but this one, he, he, uh, I, I didn't really know what to make of him at times. I mean, he was our first scene. We see him at the pool talking extremely loudly. I mean, he even talked really loud on the plane as well, but, um, he, he bordered on being, uh, an obnoxious human being and someone who was tender and caring. And I was just wondering what you guys thought of his character in this. I like Andy divine because he reminds me of a friend's father. Like they could be twins and everything I've seen him in, he is kind of that obnoxious character, but he has this charm about him that he gets away with it. And so, um, I, I don't know. It was like seeing an old friend when I saw him, I was like, Oh, it's Andy divine. So I, I liked him in the role. I thought he, he fit the, the character and, um, I thought he did, I thought he did a good job. I thought it worked. You know, um, you know, I know who Andy Devine is. I recognize him probably from, you know, millions of television or thousands of television shows or television show appearances. Um, but his first scene is him at the pool. And this film could have been an island in the pool because that guy, that guy was so big that I began to doubt the laws of physics that that plane could actually take off. And I suddenly started to believe that it could not with that kind of weight. He, he was a big guy. I mean, he was really, really big. And this is an early role. And, you know, it's he weird. Was shirtless. He, yeah. Which you got to give him credit at least. I mean, he had no modesty about anything. You know, you'd be very, you'd be very surprised to see an actor do that in movies today. But it just, his, I don't know, his voice always just reminds me of comedy, and I've never seen him that I can recall in a serious drama like this. And the 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 one thing I did like is I liked his character when he's sitting in the pilot seat and he's got all these little tools to help him move the, the everything so he can do it with his minimal amount of energy and minimal amount of, amount of exposure uh, while, while, while piloting the plane so that, you know, he doesn't get too cold. And it, it caused me to realize, and, you know, I never even thought about it, but probably planes in those days didn't have heaters in the plane. And, you know, you got, if it was cold outside, you were cold in, in the cockpit and that, that they had to deal with those types of conditions. They didn't, not unlike today where we have it so nice. That, that scene where he, uh, he was with, with the boys at the pool. Uh, I, I was distracted by him being shirtless and, and overweight, but at the same time, this is where I think I saw the tender, tenderness in him. He was a caring father just in this little scene to his boys. I mean, he still took time to 
to, you know, swim and have a little bit of competition with them and, you know, just play with them in what little time he had. And I thought it was a nice little scene uh, altogether, though. Yeah. But then he leaves them at the pool and says, find your way back home. I mean, mm-hmm. there could be there could be Gigi French pedophiles there. You know, that's all. That well, this is a... this is the 50s. So they. Yeah. Stuff. My mom used to and her siblings used to ride their bike across town and and go to the pool and go to the library that was that was not unusual or irresponsible as a as a parent to do that and i thought it kind of humanized him and the other pilots it it reminded you that they have families and a lot of the scenes like the scene with the mom and the baby lying in the bed i i thought those really helped propel this the story and and just remind you what was at stake and and how human they were and how many people their lives affected. I liked that about the film. Were there any other characters that stuck out for you guys in this film? Yeah. James Arness stuck, stuck out that kind of the, 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 the kind of the rambunctious pilot who's throwing the, the, the uh, kind of the, I don't even know what he, it was, but the, the guy out the window um, after he wakes him up, you know that it's he stood it out because I know who he is, and he I mean he was friends with reportedly friends with John Wayne, and and obviously went on to do uh, Gunsmoke for a couple decades, uh, playing Matt Dillon. So I mean he became a kind of a a television fixture that even even as a young child I remember him on television, so uh, or at least in reruns. So it, it was weird to see him in a very, very obviously young role. And he, he, he kind of, he, he's the, kind of the third major pilot. Is he the one that was looking for them? He, well, he, all the pilots were. He was one of many. It, there was a ton of pilots. It was kind of hard to that, keep up. The one that talked on the phone with the mother with the baby? No, that was not him. No? Because no, I that... know him from somewhere and I can't figure out where. Yeah, James Zarnez was the guy who got woken up, and then he grabbed the guy and threw him out the window, and then the, the guy came comes back in okay. and wakes him up again. That's James Zarnez. It was oh, okay. kind of a, a weird scene, honestly, that didn't really fit with the rest of the film, I thought. Again, I thought it was just kind of humanizing them and, and giving you some backstory I, all I know is if I was the guy that got tossed out of the window a couple of times, I would have been, go ahead, sleep in. I don't care what happens to you. Be late, you know. Considering he was trying to wake him up to go look for their friend. So that was, yeah, that was. Some people wake up really grumpy. That was him. <laughs> yeah. Now, this film was filmed on location in... Um, in uh, Donner Coldest. Lake in California. <laughs> the coldest regions of California. Woo! Uh, yeah, balmy. It was, what, 70 degrees? Minus 70? Did you say Donner Lake as in Donner Party? Uh, yeah, D-O-N-N-E-R is what I, I found. Donner Lake. Oh, very in, fitting. In Truckee, California. Very fitting. <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, what was January? About three months. So it was the, the wintry months there. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to assume a lot of the, uh, the scenes where Lori did not see them breathing, uh, the, the cold air were filmed on a studio soundstage. I mean, this film in itself probably didn't take very long to film because you have basically them out in, on the lake bed and then, or, and, or someone in a plane, either them or the people looking for them. There, it, it there was not a lot of set production for this. You know, something that I was trying to find, but I, I never did was, do you know if, um, if though, if that was stock footage of planes or if that was actually planes that they filmed for this, I kind of think that, um, that, uh, Wellman would have gone out and actually filmed these planes flying over the area for, for realism. But I, I didn't know. I couldn't really tell. I, I don't know for sure, but I'd be surprised if it was stock footage because that would be a lot of stock footage of that specific type of plane flying over that specific type of ter- uh, frozen terrain. I mean, that's that, that's a lot of stock footage for one thing. And again, it was impressive. It was very realistic and um, I, I, it was great. I, I really enjoyed the, the airplane 
flyovers and stuff. Well, this film is pretty well noted for its realism towards, uh, you know, being a, a rescue film from that era. I think it's it kind of set the stage for for films like Airplane and um, and all the the subsequent films afterwards. Airplane. <laughs> mm-hmm. Airport, airplane. Um, what was the other one? Wasn't there a, one in like the late sixties, early seventies that I'm missing? There were like five airport movies, weren't there? It was like Airport seventy seven, Airport yeah. seventy five, or something. I don't know. Airport seventy nine, the Concorde. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Laurie, we should review that one. That was the one with George Kennedy, wasn't it? He was in all of them, wasn't he? I know. <laughs> okay. Was he an airplane? No, he was in. He naked, would have been funny. Though. He was funny in the Naked Gun. Yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, John Wayne films have been known to have controversies, and I don't know if this one's different or not, um, but I I wanted to talk about uh, William Wellman himself. Um, He, in general, was not well-liked by anybody, and he despised actors maybe even more. Um, As Patrick alluded to, he pretty much only had men in his films, and this one only had, what did it have, three ladies in it, and they were all pretty much cutaway scenes or flashbacks. And uh, a little tidbit that I did note that um, he was fired by director Raoul Walsh from the film Evangeline for slapping the lead actress. And uh, uh, Wellman did not know that it was uh, director Walsh's wife that he was slapping. <laughs> so um, he's not uh, Mr. Uh, he's, he's not really a people person. Um, but I was wondering if knowing something like that um, affects your opinion of of this film because it, there wasn't a romantic interest in this film. Um, it, this was pretty much just straight, um, planes and, um, drama about the rescue and, you know, the, the women were brought in sparingly. Well, you know, I thought the women were used for what they needed to be used for. And this was not a, this was not a story of them. This is not a romance film in any way, shape or form. And I do agree with like what many of the critics identified for they didn't at least try to sh- you know force that love interest in or that romantic storyline in that would it just would have been out of place what they used in it what the the limited use that they used of female actresses in this film was it got the point across of that how these were human characters but it didn't have this overwhelming like you know like the <laughs> the the doting wife or doting girlfriend you know back at the at the base saying, I know he's alive and I'm going to stay here until he comes in. And then, you know, seeing them, you know, reconnect at the end of the film, that, that would have been over the top and a little cliche. And I'm glad they didn't. It's been done. Yes. And not well, but it has been done many times. I I completely agree with Patrick. I, I, when I watched this film, I didn't think to myself, wow, there's no women in here. It was very appropriate. It, It was just enough to, um, to keep the story compelling. And, and I think it, that the, the flashback scenes weren't too sappy. I, I, and the, the scenes that they did show, I, I thought were very well done and it never did it occur to me that, Oh, he doesn't like women. There aren't women in this film. And you can't really have a love interest in, un, in the uncharted Arctic. What are you going to have? You know what I mean? So I, it didn't. It's not broke well. back Arctic. That's for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's because the spit would have frozen in his hand when he's <laughs> his hand. Uh, something that I don't know if I missed, but uh, maybe you guys could tell me. You know how how the one woman she's like, tell my husband. Uh, you know, she wanted him to give him a message, but did he ever give her that guy the message? I know that he was reading the the little letter uh, of, you know, that from like everybody's wives or whatever. But I don't remember any of them saying uh, that specific message to any of the the rescued guys. Or did I just miss that completely? I I got the impression the guy who died that was his wife. Oh, I thought it was a different guy. You might be right, but that, that's how I interpret interpreted and I, you know, I, I don't know for sure. Um, but that was my impressions, but I could be wrong. Mm. 
See, that's kind of my complaint of this film. There are so many people. It was it was kind of hard to keep track from time to time. Because there's, what, <laughs> five planes with the crew. There was the actual crew on the ground. And then you have these these women from time to time. So it was a little hard to keep up on everything. Okay, now I'm looking it up. It does not appear that that was Lovett's wife. So Lovett's okay. character's wife doesn't show in the film. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure... I, I, I want to say it was the guy who did the um, the telegraph. I believe it was him. It, it could it could be, but you know, kind of inter- interchangeable. Okay, you're gonna go through this and not talk about how Alfalfa is in the film. What? No, I missed that completely. Carl Alfalfa Switzer. I don't Which know. one? Play- he he played the co-pilot to oh god I can't now I can't remember which plane he was in, but he was one of the co-pilots on one of the search planes. I thought he died really young. He did die very young. He died about six years after this film was made. <gasps> I didn't even recognize him. Without oh, the he, hair he stuff. Looks like, <laughs> no, he looks like an adult version of he, I mean he doesn't look that different than he does from uh, It's a Wonderful Life. I guess I just didn't pay that much attention to him. I didn't, I totally, that totally went over my head. And normally I look at IMDb, but I just didn't have time this week. It, I was lucky to get the movie watched. I finished it this evening. <laughs> so I, I didn't even see that. No, I missed well, it completely. You, yeah. You gotta go back and watch it now. He, he yeah. has a line or two as well. So it's, it's not a big substantial role, but he's there in the background. Had he sung, I would have recognized him immediately. So he wasn't yeah, yeah. he wasn't with um with Andy Devine's plane because that guy was uh his co pilot was the one who had to defrost the, the window with the knife. And Correct. That is not not on Andy Devine's plane. It was um, one of the other remember if it was James Arnes's plane or uh the other guy's plane. Hmm. I'll have to do that. You know, uh, something that also puzzled me about this is the first time that the uh, that they kind of found him, but they didn't see him, but they flew over. Why didn't they just use the flare gun at that point? Because they needed to get the movie a little bit longer, a little more tear jerking, or um, was it just the guy who was doing the telegraph machine had the flare gun and he was inside the plane? I didn't understand why they didn't use it the the first time, but they had no problem using it the second was time. It- was that the gun that was frozen and then he unfroze that he fixed it? I think that was the rifle that they were trying to use oh. to uh, find the one guy who wandered off. Oh, okay. Hey, I don't know uh, why they didn't use it before uh, when the planes go by the, f- the first or second time. Uh, it, I mean, it does seem like a bit of a plot device that they wait until the absolute, you know, most dramatic moment to finally use the flare gun, but. I don't have an explanation for you why they did that. They just did it, Chris. Okay, just yeah. deal with it. Well, I thought maybe they didn't carry uh, flare guns at that point in uh, in aviation. But then what? Uh, then the Andy Devine character, I believe, m- made mention of it. And he shot a flare gun. That was part of how they found them. Mm-hmm. At that one point. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so so they, they were... had it. They just didn't use it. Mm-hmm. They were, but they were coming more at them the, the, in the final run, and they were kind of just skirting around the edge of them. So maybe mm-hmm. they didn't shoot the flare gun because they only had one flare or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to make sure they were seen. That would make sense. I'll buy that excuse. Sure, why not? Okay, Lori. Um, how did, what did you think of the ending of this film? And on a scale of one to five, white guys... How many um, alfalfas do you give it? <laughs> um, I did like the ending. It wasn't too treacly. It um, you knew that they were saved. You didn't. You didn't really need to see it. I, I thought it ended at a really good point, and didn't you know make the film too long. Um, I you know I did like this film. There were things that I really liked about it um but i did think at times it was it could it could be a little boring i had to watch it again and 
kind of watched it a couple times. I think I was just tired and I was falling asleep every time I was watching it. I don't think that was the film, but so I it I had to watch it quite a few times. And um, but the more I watched it and the more I understood what was happening, the more I liked it. So I can see getting confused because, like you said, there were a lot of characters and you didn't get to know all of them that well. So it was it was kind of hard to to um to keep up with who was who. But I did like this film and I'm going to give it I think I'm going to give it four hats. Oh, that's quite a bit. <laughs> Patrick? Uh, I'm not going to be as forgiving as as, as Lori was on this particular film. That it is, as I said, if I've se- I think I've seen it. I can't remember if I if I've seen this and the High and the Mighty. I know I'm pretty sure I've seen the High and the Mighty, uh, but I can't remember if I've seen them both. They both didn't come out on VHS or video for a long, long time. They came out on DVD finally in like 2005, 2006. And I remember at the time going, oh, new John Wayne films that have never been released. How exciting. I've never seen these. And I rented them, I believe, off Netflix and found or recorded them on a DVR off of AMC or something like that. And and I was woefully unimpressed with both of them um, or maybe just one of them. But even watching this now, I'm just, it's not a very captivating story. I will agree with Lori, that it, it doesn't go on too long. There's not a lot of melodrama at the end about them being rescued. Although one of the key elements that I'm very curious about is how are they going to be rescued? Uh, you know, it, it seems like it would be very dangerous to land another plane on that lake bed. They and, said they were sending a ski plane. Okay. What is a I ski mean, plane? What is it? I don't I, know. I, I, I'd almost like, I'd like to see how they do this. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Is how how are they going to get out of there? Because obviously they're not getting out of there immediately because they're leaving them supplies. So it, there's going to be some sort of time waiting, and it, there's a little bit of drama to that. Is if another storm comes in, you know, they could potentially freeze to death. So, you know, there there was I, I think there was a little bit more I would like to have seen on how they ultimately got out of off that lake bed, and you know, in in, in that portion of it, but. As a whole, I, I, I found the film a little dull, a little boring, and it's not a very long film, but I still felt it could be even shorter, uh, and it would have been a little bit tighter film, maybe a little, little bit more exciting. So it is not the worst John Wayne film I've seen, but I'd only give it two out of five, two hats out of five. I'll, I'll agree with both of you that uh, there's, uh, it, was, it was a little slow, and there's times when I was bored as well. I actually liked the ending, how it ended here. Uh, when I saw the the film, The Martian, one of the things that I didn't like about that film is that after he got rescued, they went and did the little uh, scenes after, you know, where he was back on earth and living a happy life. For me, I would have liked to have seen The Martian end. Spoiler, I hadn't seen The Martian yet. Thank you, Chris. Oh, damn it. So that was, now that I've already spoiled it for you, that's where I wish they would have ended it. And uh, that's what I enjoyed about this film is that I think they ended it at the right time. I do agree with Patrick a little bit that it would have been nice to see how they are going to get them finally. But in all, I like how they ended it right there. It wasn't a sappy ending. I mean, we all knew that they were going to make it and it was a good ending. So uh, I am going to give it a little bit higher than Patrick, two and a half white hats out of five. All right, it's time to mosey off into the sunset, but you don't have to stop listening. You can get more of our blockbuster reviews over at mhmpodcastnetwork.com, where we have many more reviews from our sister shows at Movie House Memories, Lunchtime Movie Review, The Number Two Review, and Mail Bonding. Until next time, I'm Chris. I'm Lori. And I'm Patrick. Thanks once again for listening, and remember, there's more to being a cowboy than just wearing the boots.
This podcast is not endorsed by Paramount Home Video and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Island in the Sky, all names and sounds of Island in the Sky, characters, and any other Island in the Sky related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Paramount Home Video or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Sunday Seconds with the Duke, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.